Well, hi there and welcome to our Bible study on the Lighthouse Discord server. Tonight we're looking at Psalm 117 and 118. But before we begin, let's open with a word of prayer. Lord Jesus, we give you this day. Thank you that we can study your word, that we can gather together in your name, look at your word, spend time in your holy presence. Thank you for the commentaries we have. Thank you, Lord, for those who participate in our studies. And I ask, Father God, that you would be with each and every one of us. Meet all of our needs according to your riches and glory in Christ Jesus. And I especially pray for those on the server who are sick or have some sort of disability or ailment. You know all the details of each person. Draw each one close to you. Send your healing. Send your deliverance, Lord. Send your provision. And help us all to turn towards you this day. We think of the elections taking place this week. We think of the elections, the situations coming up over the next few weeks. We think of our globe today, the world around us, Lord, and all that's happening in Russia, the Ukraine, what's taking place between North and South Korea, what's happening in Israel, God, with Hamas and Lebanon and all of these other places. Lord Jesus, we pray for your protection. We pray for your will to be accomplished, Lord. We give it all over to you. Help us to find our peace, our strength, our hope in you. In your holy name we pray, dear Jesus. Amen. So we're on to Psalm 117. as very short. It's two verses. A psalm of praise. Praise the Lord, all nations. Laud him, all peoples. For his loving kindness is great toward us. And the truth of the Lord is everlasting. Praise the Lord. Talk about short, but rich. So our commentary is telling us, and I think if any of us read the Psalms, we would know that this is the Bible's shortest psalm. Now, we don't know who wrote it, but it is the fifth psalm in this series, 113 to 118, that is either sung or recited during the Jewish festival of Passover. And it's a burst of praise, basically. And Paul, the New Testament apostle, quotes Psalm 117.1 in Romans 15.11 as evidence of God's heart of love for all the people of the world. So it's kind of interesting to hear that Mr. Sadler, who was a, a boyhood school Sunday school teacher uh, for the commentator, promised a prize to every boy in his class who would memorize a verse of scripture for, by the next Sunday. Now, I never had that. I didn't attend Sunday school, but I can remember hearing people talk about these memorization verses. And in fact, when I taught Sunday school, that was a thing. And most often people would learn John eleven thirty five, 35, Jesus wept, because it's just two words, the shortest verse in the Bible. And of course, this Sunday school teacher laughed, you know, and, and gave the commentator a blue ribbon for scripture memory. But, excuse me, if we think about it, if the teacher challenged us to memorize a chapter of the Bible, I bet you that we would probably go to Psalm 117 because it's the shortest psalm and the shortest chapter in the Bible. And in fact, I want to mention that at a church we attended here uh, soon after we moved and we were there for a little while, there was someone who visited the church a couple of times 
And it was fascinating because this individual actually memorized an entire book of the Bible and would literally present that book, like recite scripture as their sermon. So didn't add any words, no commentary, but literally preached the real word of God, right from scripture, but knowing it by heart. And I found that really fascinating because Psalm 117, while the shortest psalm and the shortest chapter, it's not two words, but it's two verses. It equates to about 30 words, depending on the translation. But like every other psalm, it's loaded with instruction and insight. And Martin Luther, the 16th century reformer and preacher, actually devoted 36 pages to Psalm 117 in his massive commentary on the Psalms. James Montgomery Boyce, a modern preacher in Philadelphia, preached four sermons on just these two verses. Derek Kidner, in his commentary on the psalm, said, the shortest psalm proves, in fact, to be one of the most potent. And isn't that true? I mean, God's word is potent. It is powerful. It is jam-packed with information and promises that we don't get anywhere else. And what strikes the commentator and me about this little psalm is that it's calling on all nations and all people to praise the Lord. And let me ask, how often do we praise the Lord? See, Gentiles is the Hebrew word goyim. Have you ever heard of a non-Jewish person called a goy or a goyim? I haven't heard it so much, uh, excuse me, in real life, maybe a little bit in movies, but more so in books that I've read. But it means the peoples of the earth, the non-Jewish nations. And Psalm 117 is a missionary psalm because it called all people in every culture, from every ethnic background, to praise and worship the one true God. So for almost 2,000 years, God had focused his attention on one family, the descendants of Abraham through Isaac and Jacob. And God had channeled his word and his blessings to and through the people of Israel, the Jews. But God never lost sight of the rest of the world. His people, Israel, were to take the message of God's love and faithfulness to the whole world. The sad part is that Israel thought God's love was only for them. So instead of telling the world about the living God, they put up barriers to keep Gentiles out. But then Jesus comes and opened the doors of salvation to all who would believe, to Jews and to Gentiles. And if you're interested in reading a bit more about that, have a read of Acts 2.21 and 1 Timothy 2 verse 4. You see, the commission of the church is to go into the whole world with the message of Jesus' love. Have a look at Matthew 28, 19 to 20, which we have in our About Us channel, and also Acts 13, verse 47. But the sad part is that we tend to think the good news of salvation is only for us. So we tend to circle the wagons and we put up barriers to keep the outside world in. That's really a shame. That's not what God intended for us to do. And Psalm 117 is a reminder that God sees our world much differently than we do. 
he sees it through the eyes of compassion and faithful love. And his grace reaches out to every person. Warren Wearsby wrote, God's people are saved by faith and live by faith, but our faith would mean nothing were it not for his faithfulness that endures forever. If God calls us to do something, he is faithful to help us do it. 1 Thessalonians 5.24 To rely on our faith is to put faith in faith, but to rely on God's faithfulness is to put faith in the Lord. Our assurance is in the word of God and the God of the word. And I'll just share a little bit here for a moment because we have time. When we moved here, I wasn't sure what God had in mind for me for ministry. And I sought out this homeless shelter that was Christian run, um, you know, by a board of directors. It's a separate charity, but it was a homeless shelter. And they also had a lot of people come in. Of course, this is before COVID, but had a lot of people come in for lunches who were impoverished and hungry. And I started doing weekly devotionals because they would have a devotion before every meal. And I started doing weekly devotionals on Thursdays right before they would have lunch, which was almost always soup and sandwich. And it was a wonderful time for me. I loved it. I would literally go around the room and greet every single person who was there. I would shake their hand. I would greet them, talk with them, listen, sit amongst them, share the devotional, and then have lunch with these folks. It was a beautiful time. There were moments when it got to be a little bit frightening, I think, for my husband, because some of these people could be a little bit maybe on the violent side. And so after that first year, I moved to once a month. And then when COVID started to happen, I stopped and God was having leading me in a different direction. But to think how wonderful it was to be able to meet with people who were really down on their luck, who didn't have another place to go. You know, the circumstances were sometimes just incredible. And I'm so thankful that I had that opportunity. That's what God wants us to do. Maybe not be in a homeless shelter. Maybe it's with seniors and the elderly. Maybe it's to prepare, you know, sandwiches and hand them out or go and help somewhere, you know, at a soup kitchen. Um, maybe it's to collect socks and gloves or scarves or toiletries or whatever. There's a place for all of us to do our part if we would only be willing to do it. And I think it's so important that we do that. And if we can't for whatever reason, then pray. Get on our knees and let's pray for folks. There's so many different things that we can do to honor and bless other folks. You see, God sees these people differently than we do. We tend to look at them the way they look, the way they smell, the way their hair is done, where they live, etc., etc., etc. But God looks at them with love because these people, just like you and me, were created in the image of God. Just throwing that out there. Let's move on to Psalm 118. Thanksgiving for the Lord's saving goodness. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his loving kindness is everlasting. All let Israel say his loving kindness is everlasting. All let the house of Aaron say his loving kindness 
is everlasting. Excuse me. Oh, let those who fear the Lord say his loving kindness is everlasting. From my distress, I called upon the Lord. The Lord answered me and set me in a large place. The Lord is for me. I will not fear. What can man do to me? The Lord is for me among those who help me. Therefore, I will look with satisfaction on those who hate me. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in man. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in princes. All nations surrounded me. In the name of the Lord, I will surely cut them off. They surrounded me, yes. They surrounded me. In the name of the Lord, I will surely cut them off. They surrounded me like bees. They were extinguished as a fire of thorns. In the name of the Lord, I will surely cut them off. You pushed me violently so that I was falling, but the Lord helped me. The Lord is my strength and song, and he has become my salvation. The jo or sorry, the sound of joyful shouting and salvation is in the tents of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. The right hand of the Lord is exalted. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. I will not die, but live and tell of the works of the Lord. The Lord has disciplined me severely, but he has not given me over to death. Open to me the gates of righteousness. I shall enter through them. I shall give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous will enter through it. I shall give thanks to you, for you have answered me, and you have become my salvation. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous on our eyes. This is the day which the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. O Lord, do save, we beseech you. O Lord, we beseech you, do send prosperity. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God and he has given us light. Bind the festival sacrifice with cords to the horns of the altar. Excuse me. You are my God, and I give thanks to you. You are my God, I extol you. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his loving kindness is everlasting. May God add his blessing to the reading of Psalm 118. So this is a bit different. Again, we don't know who wrote Psalm 118. The other one was certainly a burst of praise. This one is a celebration of God's deliverance. It's a psalm of praise probably used as worshipers made their way into the place of worship. And we could look at verse 27 again for that. And it's the final psalm in this series of six psalms, 113 through 118, used during the Jewish festival of Passover, which is, again, kind of interesting. Psalm 118 was actually Martin Luther's favorite psalm. He wrote the tribute, This is my own beloved psalm. Although the entire Psalter and all of Holy Scripture are dear to me as my own comfort and source of life, I fell in love with this psalm. Now, how many passages of Scripture can you say you fell in love with? When Martin Luther felt abandoned by emperors and kings, he knew the Lord was his protection, his strength, and his song. In Psalm 118, verse 14. Now, for me, Psalm 139 is one that I've fallen in love with. And of course, the book of Philippians, especially 
Philippians 2 verses 1 through 11, where it talks about the humility of Christ. But the entire book of Philippians has become one of great interest to me in Acts 2. Verses 42 to 47 talks about a church meeting in homes and just, in my mind, is really important to me. But Psalm 118 is the last of the praise songs sung by the people of Israel at Passover. And it seems to summarize their journey from slavery in Egypt to the security of the promised land. Christians enjoy the psalm because spiritually we have made the same journey. We've come out of sin slavery through the Red Sea of conversion across the wilderness of discipleship and finally into the rest of God's faithful love. The Lord really is good. Psalm 118 verses 22 and 23 from the New King James the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. You see, friends, in the context of this psalm, the rejected stone is Israel. A builder looks for the most attractive stone with which to finish his work. And when the leaders of the world looked at ancient Israel, they didn't see much significance. Israel was basically cast aside and kicked around. But God was doing a great work in Israel. He was preparing his own people to welcome the Messiah, Jesus, God's own son. And Jesus came to his own, but he too was rejected as insignificant and unworthy of honor. And the religious leaders condemned him and the Roman officials crucified him. But God was doing a great work in Jesus. He raised Jesus from the dead, and he exalted him to a place far above every earthly leader. The rejected stone became the stone of greatest value, the stone that holds everything else together. And if you want to know more about being exalted, as I mentioned earlier on my own, have a look at Philippians 2, verses 9 through 11. You see, the Apostle Peter loved this verse from Psalm 118 when he was hauled in front of the Jewish council for healing a man. They asked, By what power or by what name have you done this? In Acts 4 7, Peter's response was a karate chop to their spiritual pride. Let it be known to you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man stands here before you whole. This is the stone which was rejected by you builders, which has become the chief cornerstone. Nor is there salvation in any other. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. And that, friends, comes from Acts 4, verses 10 through 12. And Peter also quoted Psalm 118, 22 in the letter of 1 Peter. Coming to him as to a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious, you also as living stones are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. That comes from 1 Peter 2, 4 to 5. See, some people will stumble, stumble over Jesus. Some are going to reject him. But others come to him in faith and find that he is a secure foundation forever. So the people of Israel use verses 25 and 26 of Psalm 118 to honor Jesus on the day that we call Palm Sunday. All four gospel writers tell the story. Matthew 21, 9, Mark 11, 9 to 10, 
Luke 19.39, and John 12.13. The people shouted Hosanna, which means save now, from Psalm 118, verse 25. And blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Since it was at the time of the Passover festival that Jesus entered the city of Jerusalem, and since this psalm was sung at Passover, these words were already in the minds of the people. Jesus entered the city on the very day that lambs were taken into Jewish homes in preparation for the Passover sacrifice a few days later. Jesus would become our Passover lamb, when he died on the cross. And because of his death in our place, the judgment of God passes over us who believe in him. Lord, I'm not sure who's in our voice chat at the moment. I'm not sure who will listen to this at any other point in time. I don't know. Who exactly is walking very closely to you? But I do know, Lord, that you love us and that you died on the cross for our sins willingly. Knowing the pain, knowing the suffering, but being willing to die for us, Jesus, because that is how your Father chose to bring deliverance and salvation to us all because of the sin, our sin and the original sin in the world. So, Lord, I pray today that anyone who hears these words would realize their intense need of you. That we would turn our lives over to you. That we would seek your forgiveness that we would repent from our sin and believe in you as our Lord and Savior. Change us, renew us, make us more like you, Lord. We pray all of these things in your holy name. Amen.